Well, welcome uh, to the interview segment of Wisdom from World Religions for this week. And this week, uh, it's my pleasure to have as our guest and to introduce to you Professor Graham Schweig. Uh, Professor Graham Schweig uh, is uh, Director of Studies in Religion at Christopher Newport University in Virginia, but uh, he is all, has many other titles as well. Uh, he is the Distinguished Research and Teaching Fellow at the Mira and uh, A.J. Shingle Center for Dharma Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He's also Director of Theology at the Avanti Schools, uh, Avanti Schools Trust in the United Kingdom and Senior Editor of the Journal of Vaishnava Studies. Uh, Professor Schweig has, uh, was, has taught in various places, including uh, the University of North Carolina, uh, at, and he was also taught Sanskrit at the University of Virginia. Professor Schweig is the author of uh, multiple publications, uh, including the Bhagavad Gita, The Beloved Lord's Secret Love Song from HarperCollins, The Dance of Divine Love, uh, uh, The Ras Lila of Krishna from the Bhagavata Purana, India's classic sacred love story, uh, and also A Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti. Um, and uh, Professor Schweig has also published countless articles, well over 100 publications, other books as well, many other books also being prepared. Uh, he is, uh, his translation of the Bhagavad Gita is globally renowned as perhaps the best translation now available, uh, and uh, it's highly recommended uh, uh, by many academics uh, for use in, in, in teaching sessions, but it's also a wonderfully, uh, a wonderful Bhagavad Gita translation for people who want to study it to get its spiritual significance. Uh, so today, prof welcome, Professor Schweig. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, we have a lot of material to cover today in our short time, uh, and I think uh, I, I will just, so, but before I start, I'll just note some of Professor Schweig's um, uh, interests, which include Hinduism and the religions of India, yoga philosophy and Sanskrit literature, love mysticisms, comparative religion and theology, interfaith dialogue, Hindu and Christian comparative theology, and religious pluralism. Um, so, Professor Schweig, um, since you are well known as a translator of the Bhagavad Gita, can you speak to us uh, about the spiritual significance of this classic Hindu text? Yes, thank you. Um, the Bhagavad Gita has held a fascination for Western scholars and the, really the general uh, Western culture for a couple of hundred years, at least since 1785, since the first translation of it in, uh, by Charles Wilkins. Mm -hmm. And dozens and dozens and dozens of translations, as you well know, yes. have been produced. Yes. And so the question may be, why did I go ahead and translate the Bhagavad Gita? Well, there have been a lot of uh, strides made, I think, in modern scholarship to avoid bringing the Western ethos into a translation of something that's, that's Eastern. So I was inspired as someone who trained in Sanskrit and someone who loves uh, Indian culture and, and spirituality, I wanted to bring out the Gita's poetic and philosophical content. And when I did, uh, and it, in my attempt to, to produce a, such a work, I found things in the Gita I never knew were there. And particularly this very loving message, and this, of course, has to do with love mysticism. This, this greatest secret of all is what it's called in the Gita. Sarva Goyatamam Bhuya Shinu Me Paramang Bachaha. It's there in 18, chapter 18, verse 64. The greatest secret of all, the, the, uh, um, uh, my supreme message, Krishna says, and it's so simple. Uh, you are so much loved by me. Now, mind you, Dr. Rose, this is a statement made from a God who is not a judgmental God, but a generous God. Hmm. It, is a, it is, is not a God of, of, uh, of um, uh, justice. It's a, it's a, it's a God of, of love and beauty. And, and playfulness even. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things I sought to bring out. Uh, so uh, can you say then uh, something else uh, about the Bhagavad Gita's appeal then? Is the Bhagavad Gita only for Hindus? Oh, uh, very good. Well, I mean, just the evidence I gave 
of it being a uh, holding the fascination of Westerners for at least a couple of hundred years, um, uh, and is well it, the Gita is well known as being a fascinating text to Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. and the the American transcendentalists, also um, uh, Emerson as well, the philosopher uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, the Gita, I believe, is very attractive to many persons in many cultures because of its uh, teachings striking a universal chord. Mm -hmm. And that's a universal chord, I believe, of loving action in the world, uh, the ability to go within deeply, and the ability to, to uh, f discover a heart, a loving heart in relation to the divine. I think these three things mm -hmm. are very attractive to people in many cultures. Yes, yes, indeed they are, uh, and that of course leads directly to questions about yoga, which is uh, which is a global phenomenon now. Mm. Yes, uh, what what is yoga? Yoga is best translated as union, but I wish it were that simple, Doctor Rose, because it's there are various types of union and various states of union, various ways of becoming united with one thing with another. Let me just put it this way. Union implies two things coming together. So it could be my hurt back coming together with my healthy rest of my body. Mm -hmm. and so that's the physical part of yoga, okay? But frankly, union can also mean uh, bringing together my lower self with my higher self, or it could mean bringing my whole self in union with the divine self. So there are various kinds of union and various ways of achieving it. Well, you said that, uh, some, is, there something more, so is there something more than the physical side to yoga? Absolutely. In fact, um, the work I'm currently uh, focusing on, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, uh, a work that's over 2,000 years ago, is really kind of the Bible of yoga, sort of it's, it's the classic text Mm -hmm. on the psychology and practice and philosophy of yoga. And in that text is, uh, in that text of 196 aphorisms, only three aphorisms are devoted to the physical part of yoga. Oh, well, why is it so popular then? Uh, in, uh, uh, you, you teach uh, in a lot of settings where people are training to be yoga teachers, uh, why then is the Yoga Sutra so, so popular in these contexts uh, if it only has three verses that are or three uh, sutras that deal with the physical side of yoga? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> the, the, the reason being is that the history of yoga has moved more and more to the more external practices of yoga. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's the place where yoga starts. The Ashtanga system deals with eight limbs. Mm -hmm. eight limbs. And so the first limb uh, deals with the um, um, ethical practices, the essential ethical practices. The second limb, the sacred personal practices. Mm -hmm. And the third limb deals with the posturing of the body, the positioning of the body. And these limbs go ever and ever more inward toward perfect meditation, which is the last three limbs. So yoga is about meditation. Ultimately, yes. Even when you practice the limbs, you can't divorce that that limb of the physical part from the other limbs. Just as you can't take the the arm away from the rest of my body. Yes. So, in some sense, the arm is always connected to whatever else is going on in the rest of my body. So, similarly, the hatha yoga, the physical practice of yoga, is intimately connected to meditation in the ultimate sense, yes. Ah, yes. Um, well, you know, there are so many different varieties of yoga that one encounters, say, in the local yoga studio or, or yoga, uh, 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 even at gyms. But th is this related in any way to traditional yoga in India? Uh, and what okay. are, if so what are some of the types of yoga that were taught, that were taught anciently in India? Okay, well, in the ancient Vedas, in the Upanishads, and those, um, that, those ancient times, yoga was found, we have evidence on steatite seals and, 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 and various carvings that yoga did involve 
posturing the body, some deep breathing exercises, and meditation. Mm -hmm. As the history of yoga develops more and more into the second millennium, the physical and sort of the, the kind of um, uh, uh, states, subtle uh, states of yoga um, became much more a preoccupation. And so, um, and, and so also the physical part, the proliferation of yoga postures. So, you know, now you can find people doing a thousand different postures. And, and it, you know, it, it's, it's just um, moved in that direction. But originally, yoga was a very deep psycho-meditative practice that moved one into an inner world of the spiritual self. That's, thank you for that. The inner world is one of the themes in, uh, in your life and in your work. And you, what, is, what is the inner world uh, besides just you know, my thoughts? Okay, good. Um, I would say that there are actually three worlds. There is the outer world that's interactive. There's the inner world that is cognitive. And then there's the innermost world of the affective. The innermost world of, of, of the heart, of the, the, the deepest seat of feeling. You know, Dr. Rose, we come into this world not acting in, in the outer world very well or effectively with those baby limbs that we all come with. We don't think yet, but we feel. We come into the world feeling. Mm -hmm. And on our deathbeds, we will not be very active either. And it's a little late to be thinking about things. It's about what we're left with in the heart. And the Upanishads speak, as you know, about the space within the heart, mm. the opening up to the whole universe. For our, for our uh, participants, uh, the Upanishads, can you say a few words about the Upanishads? Uh, I'm sorry, yes. The Upanishads were a kind of post-Vedic development where um, you have recordings of teacher-student dialogues, much the way we have with the Socratic dialogues. Mm -hmm. And later Upanishads went more into verse uh, 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 presentations of nice. the philosophy. But this is a philosophy that really examines the nature of oneness mm. amidst um, infinite diversity. You know, Hinduism is famous uh, for stressing oneness. Would you say that that is a central idea that uh, in Hinduism? In, indeed. I think that other cultures either haven't discovered it in the West or um, it becomes something that just is uh, a difficult, it's not in the Western religious vocabulary, practically. Uh, I, I really think it's an Eastern phenomenon. I, I, I don't know if you would agree with me totally, I but would, yes. Yes, you would. Okay, so it really is this idea of oneness, of unity. But again, there are varieties of conceptions of mm -hmm. unity. Yes. yes. Which, is fascinating. Well, you were speaking a few moments ago about feeling and that it, we come into this world with feeling before language and we leave with feeling. Yes. Um, and, and so is there a, a kind of yoga that stresses feeling? Mm. So that would be called bhakti, bhakti yoga. The yoga of uh, really of, uh, of a heart, a deep, the deepest heartfelt participation in relating to the oneness and to the uh, the and to the uh, uh, nature of of the divine, so it's a it's it's where we feel at the deepest level of the self. Now we have all kinds of feelings during the day. I feel tired. I feel awake. I feel happy. I feel melancholic. Whatever. But we're talking about a level of feeling that is of the nature of Brahman, as the Upanishads describe it. This oneness. Um, a, a, a kind of connectivity to all being. And in fact, if you take the Sanskrit word bhava, which means being, as you know, yes. and you, you intensify the vowel to bhava, mm. going from bhava to bhava, bhava means feeling. So feeling is when existence crystallizes and comes together in one's heart Nice. That's what we're talking about in the way of feeling. I don't want to minimize. I don't want to 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 uh, uh -huh. sort of um, uh, kind of make it mediocre. It's 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 a it's feeling that 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 crystallizes being. 
I, I like how you use the Sanskrit there, and for any, people who study Sanskrit, you go yeah. from that short A to that long A. That's, that's actually, right. Exactly. Bhava to bhava. Yes. So would you say so? Emotion, feelings, then, isn't just as in our. It's not the way we often use it every day, as you said. So feeling, then, in this sense, or bhakti, is a pathway to the divine, or a pathway to to the supreme. Indeed. Indeed. And yes. And in your work, I mean, uh, so what? where does Krishna fit into all of this? Okay, so, you know, Krishna, of course, is the uh, main voice in the Bhagavad Gita. Out of the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita, 575 verses are spoken by Krishna. So it is essentially the teaching of Krishna that we hear in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And the, the teachings of the Gita are complex. It's not the easiest book in the world to read, and therefore it's good if someone knowledgeable can teach it and show the diverse kinds of practices that Krishna explains. But ultimately, he points all of these, according to my interpretation, it points all of these point to this deepest seated feeling level, and he brings that out with his own feeling you are so much loved by me, this greatest secret of all. And, and this love that we're talking about is the bhava into bhava, as we, as we talked wow. about. So, so another one of your major works is Dance of Divine Love. I imagine that this is a nice way of leading into some discussion of, of your work in that area. Yes. Okay. So Dance of Divine Love is a, is a translation of the really the ancient Indian equivalent of the uh, biblical Song of Songs, the biblical Song of Solomon. And this is where, really, uh, the great metaphor and metonymic of romantic love is used as a way of engaging this deep-seated feeling with the feeling coming from the divine. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's so effusively expressive in beautiful, luxuriant poetry uh, in the Bhagavata Purana. So this is yet another text in sacred India on the Bhagavata Purana, different from the Bhagavad Gita. This is where Krishna ultimately displays a dance, an eternal dance with souls. As a Christian honors the cross, the uh, Hindu in these traditions will honor the great circle dance of divinity who intimately connects with each and every soul in an, in an eternal dance of love. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that's the, the dance of divine love. And so can, can, can individuals see themselves as being caught up in that dance? That's exactly the goal, Dr. Rose. You, that, that in, this, uh, in, in many Hindu traditions, the whole idea is when you leave this mortal world and, and, and uh, 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 leave this mortal coil, um, you can go to a place that is eternal, that is simply filled with all that is beautiful, all that is playful, and all that is delightful. Mm -hmm. And this is the dance of the divine love. That is nicely stated. You know, I think that many people with a with a kind of a, you know, minimal knowledge of Hinduism tend to think of it mostly as being about meditation, maybe yoga, and about becoming one with everything. This sounds so different from that. The oneness here is a kind of uh, non-separateness from divine. Mm -hmm. In Hinduism, nothing can be separate from the divine. This is a little different than what we find in Western traditions. Right. It's a vision that understands and appreciates everything as a manifestation of the divine. Right. So, but then within that, oneness is, is an expressiveness of divine otherness. And so we remain discrete individuals in relation to the supreme individual. And this is also expressed in the Upanishads. Yes. So that's all fancy Sanskrit for those of you out there. That simply means that there is this infinite reality within which we remain infinitely individual beings 
to transact a very loving oneness. Thank you for that. Um, Professor Schweig, um, were you born Hindu? No, uh, I was born uh, in, the, in the Western world. I was born to um, uh, a Jewish family who was really not that Jewish. They were really a, an educated family. A, a father was a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist and a mother who was uh, into uh, fine art and poetry and literature. And so I sort of combined the two. Uh, wonderful parents. I combine the two and fast and and fascinated with religious experience, which is the psychoanalytic side, yes. and poetry, which is my mother's side. Mm -hmm. And I bring that together as much as I can to bear upon uh, the idea of of looking at these wonderful mystical literatures of love. Well, so um, according to your biography, you've been in India many times, and you were also there as, as when you were fairly young. Can can you say yeah. a, something about your journeys, or especially the early journeys to India? Yes, I was fascinated with yoga. I started practicing yoga when I was fourteen years old, and I uh, was reading the Bhagavad Gita. I was reading the Upanishads. I was reading all of the as much as I could the sacred literature coming from India. I also read the Bible, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated with the tradition into which I was born and the culture in which I'm, you know, which, which is flooded with really, you know, the, the, the Christian tradition and a good bit of the Jewish tradition as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I wanted to find out where was I most comfortable, what resonated with my heart, with my mind the most. And I just found this in the ancient Vedas, the, the Upanishads, and in the Bhagavad Gita, and in the practice of yoga, which struck me as a very tangible way of approaching the divine, a very concrete method for moving closer and closer to the divine. So you were fairly young, though, when you made your first landing, when you first arrived in India, sometime I, in the 1970s? I was 18. I was 18. Yes, and I, went, I went over there with five other friends who were all older than me. Yes. And I lost them all. <laughs> and where did you go? I ended up, you know, moving around uh, different places in the midsection of India. Yes. Um, I went to the Ajanta and Ellora Caves and mm -hmm. I explored um, different yoga ashrams. Finally, I ended up in New Delhi on my way to Vrindavan, which is the celebrated city for mm -hmm. Krishna. I see. Yeah. Uh, well, Professor Schweig, uh, we're slowly coming to the end of our time together, but I'm just curious to know uh, uh, about you, since you seem to have three, at least three uh, academic appointments, can, can you say something about your work with these three different uh, in institutions, the Avanti uh, Trust, uh, the Graduate yeah. Theological Union, and also uh, Christopher Newport University? Well, here is where, at the very, at the very basic level, I try to help students and interested persons in lectures and so on at the Smithsonian and so on. People don't know a lot about Hinduism. I try to explain mm -hmm. to them some of the key contributions I think that Hinduism makes to the world. That was going to be my last question. Thank oh, you. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, yeah. I beat you to it. And yeah. so I'll cover both. I, I'll try. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say that India is a religion that naturally, I mean, India has a religion that is naturally pluralistic. Mm -hmm. It's extremely comfortable with otherness. And the Vedas really express this. There's so much religiosity and there's so many religions within the Vedas. So we have to be careful when we say Hinduism, it sounds like one religion. It's, yeah. it, is a, it is a so-called religion, but I prefer to say a religious complex. Mm -hmm. And within that complex, you have the ancient Vedic adage from over 3,000 years ago that goes, um, uh, e ekam sat vipra bahuda vedanti, a, an often mistranslated phrase, which yeah. is so beautiful. There is one reality about which vibrant persons in various ways speak. Now, I just... Dr. Rose, I think this is one of the most beautiful adages anywhere that's ever been spoken, because it shows how we all have our different access to truth, and we have our different truths, but we live in one reality, and here we can share them. And the Vedas knew that thousands of years ago. 
So that's fascinating. Is it seems to be the case that religious pluralism was was already a kind of mature philosophy then, uh, so long ago. I I I, I echo echo exactly what you just said. And I feel that, again, I don't think many people understand this about the Hindu complex, that really within there, as far back as the Vedas, the oldest sacred texts in the world, you have that phrase, reality is one. And in various ways, people speak about it. And so to get closer to reality, we need to share with one another. Mm -hmm. And that's what the world has yet to really learn. I'm hoping my students will save the world one day, Dr. Rose. Thank you for that, Dr. Schweig. So it seems that one of the, that's one of the major contributions of Hinduism to the world is this idea that truth is spoken variously by different people. And I guess others would include yoga, and um, yoga is obviously a great contribution of India to, to the planet. And I, I, I really feel that, that yoga has its place even socially. It means each of us unite, how? In dialogue, in yeah. sharing. Mm -hmm. That's the yoga when we're not on the mat or in meditation. Yes. The yoga in the world, in the outside world, is about you and I connecting through dialogue and sharing. Excellent. Well, uh, it's really been a pleasure to speak with you on our interview segment this week in Wisdom from World Religions. But before I go, I'd just like to ask, is there anything that I neglected to ask or any, any other point you'd like to add before we go? Oh, Dr. Rose, you and I know there are endless topics that we can focus on in this you know, beautiful idea of, of how the human heart and the human mind try to understand something infinite with you know, our little facility, but that's the power of the infinite. It can make itself known to the finite. And that's what's so fascinating to me.